So I, um, I've been asked to talk about innovating engineering education. So I've spent like 20 years, actually a little bit more, on doing that in Sweden and internationally. And I have scars all over my body. <laughs> So we could, I, could, I could talk at length about what to do with engineering education to make it far more fabulous in the eyes of students and uh, uh, society and employers, etc. Uh, I'm also finishing just now a book with an MIT professor and, uh, and a professor at TU Dublin about universities as engines for sustainable economic development. So I could talk about that too. But I thought, okay, this is a professor installation we can be a little bit critical now. So, uh, just for the purpose of uh, this talk, I, I'd like to just basically remind myself what is innovation. It, there has to be something no novel, original, creative about it. And it could be in many dimensions. It could be in the conditions, the process, the result, etc. Uh, it has to be feasible and viable. That's uh, very important. We can't just have a dream meringue. We have to be able to realize it. It has to deliver added value of some kind to some stakeholders. So there is uh, this added value. It has to improve things for at least some parties. And uh, it's, uh, it can't just be an idea. We have to be able to make it happen. That's what uh, distinguishes innovation from invention, right? Um, so anyway, I was thinking, on my way here, why is it precisely these things that we tend to call innovative? And why not the other things? I read a lot of um, when uh, people apply to be promoted or hired for in a university, and I do a, a pedagogical evaluation of their application. And they all write about basically the same thing, how they are so modern and innovative. And I'm thinking, there is something interesting here. So, I've, and also because I've been working on deploying these kinds of educations for a long time, I've been thinking there is something we haven't quite figured out about the conditions. So to understand innovation, to understand the conditions for change in engineering education, I think we need to understand how the university works in the first place. And I think a lot of... Uh, engineers, as myself, we tend to have a very rationalist approach. We have, we have an idea of rational, rationality in the organization. We are organized to produce uh, our outcomes, to, to pursue our goals in an efficient manner. But time and time again, it's like we are banging our noses against the wall that we didn't understand that it was there. So while we have, we think, the most, the most wonderful suggestions, it seems that they sometimes don't take hold at all because there are some other forces at play. So I studied that and I came into something called institutional theory. Do you guys know what that is? Someone is scratching their head, but I don't think it was a... No. Yeah, so I'll do the elevator pitch. <laughs> it's such a shock. Uh, organizational or inst institutional theory holds that actually organizations are not shaped for effectively controlling its production. Uh, there is something else. And that other thing which is more important than effective production, is to conform to social norms called institutions in the society, in the um, uh, environment. And uh, especially an organization whose output is very difficult to measure, then it's more important to conform to these social norms than to be effective in our output. And I can't think of a better example than education, where actually the quality of our output is rather dif difficult to measure. I'm the editor of a journal, and I get lots of manuscripts where people try to argue that they have measured improvements, but it is very difficult. Um, and so if, if it's more important to be legitimate in the light of those rules and norms, it means that we are operating in a logic of appropriateness it has to seem appropriate 
rather than it has to actually produce the outputs that we should do. So the logic of appropriateness is a very important thing. And uh, also because those rules and norms come from different parts of the environment. They are very often in conflict with each other and they can also especially be in conflict with our rational production of outputs. So that creates lots of tensions that we have to absorb somehow in the organization. And this is probably the most familiar part of, of uh, institutional theory, that in the organizational field with the university sector, for instance, there is pressure to conform to the same values and norms. And that means that organizations become more alike. And especially if there is uncertainty in we don't know where we are heading or it's difficult to distinguish between means and, uh, and uh, objectives, then looking alike becomes a very important strategy. So for instance, you can see a lot of mimetic behavior when we are mimicking players that have high status in the organizational field. So for instance, universities who don't know what to do with e-learning they tend to uh, mimic MIT, because that's a safe bet. They are a high status player, so let's do like MIT. We don't know if it's the thing we should do, but at least we look good and etc. Um, you, you can see it's called isomorphism when things tend to become most alike. If you go to uh, these kinds of uh, innovation spaces that universities have, you can see they have even the same kind of design furniture, the same lamps, the same color schemes, the same... I think they buy it all from the same catalog. <clears throat> so, if you look inside the university, there are competing logics and those logics can be of a different kind. Uh, there are professional logics that control, for instance, peer review is run by the professional logic. Market logic, when we have technology transfer. State logic, when it comes to our awarding degrees to the students, etc. And if I look at engineering education, I, I think I identify two different logics, or rather two the logics of two different professions, where one is the engineering profession that we educate for, and the other is the academic profession that we belong to. And uh, you could say, um, the, the view on what engineering education is, or the role of the educator, will differ so if you think in terms of your academic profession, your role would be to teach the theory of your discipline to the students. But if you think according to a, an engineering profession logic, your role is to teach the future engineers. So that uh, would then contain the disciplinary theory that they need, but it also contains a lot of other skills and approaches and values and judgment and hands-on, etc. So I made a little table, and those of you who are interested can study the PDF afterwards. But I, I really need to put the disclaimer here now. When I, when I make this analytic view, uh, the point is definitely that we need both. We need both, and we need them in a meaningful relationship. Just because I'm um, depicting them as, as a part, we really need both. And then I thought, it's, there is something like the similar tension within research. So you, if you see the university as... Oh, one snooze, oh yeah. If you see the university as academia, the purpose of research is to further the discipline. My, my, uh, my, so my co-author in this book, the MIT professor, he said that he was at University of Cambridge in the UK, and the provost there, or whatever the title was, said, oh, it's funny, because here in Cambridge, UK, that is, um, our job is to build the discipline. But you guys at MIT, you seem to be solving problems. <laughs> so that is a little bit of different mindset. So the other view you could have on the university, on the purpose of research, 
is to contribute to society, to consider how can this be used to uh, address the problems in, in society. And again, I think we need both. We, we need the disciplines. The role of the disciplines is to qualify what the work that we see as, as worthy, and we need to further the, the, the knowledge in itself also. But we, we have those two poles, you could say, in our identity. And a, an institution like Chalmers, where I studied, or KTH in Stockholm, where I work, or TU Eindhoven, we are straddling this uh, ecology. This is our niche, that we are doing both. We are academia, but we're also serving society with, with our research. If you put those together, um, I came to a quite a horrible conclusion, because I felt that it's actually rather easy for us to devise education that, is, that has a healthy balance between the theory and the hands-on professional preparation. But however we try to do that, it seems that the balance is often disrupted. And my theory is that as long as the research pra practice is too much dominated by the academic logic, rather than the serving society logic. Uh, that means the, the faculty will become much more attuned to the discipline, to furthering their own career, rather than thinking how can they do work that serves society. And through faculty, that um, uh, imbalance will, will um, will affect education, so that the balance is shifted also in education towards teaching theory rather than teaching the new generation of professionals. And uh, the, more, the more research dominates over education in any university, that influence will be even stronger. So, I've been thinking about educational innovation as something that a university does to compensate for this. Because it's so obvious for us that these innovative education, that kind of education is so much needed for, for the engineers that we are sending out into society. So we need to do things to compensate uh, for, for those values that we need that are not sufficiently represented. And it's often about, so I didn't hear your brainstorming before I wrote this, problem-based, open-ended, real-world problems, challenge-based, interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary. It's the creative, hands-on design part, and it's the student-centered, empowering students. And I would argue that if you have too much of a discipline-based organization, which easily happens because you think about research, then those values are really difficult to produce for a university. And I see that we, when, we, when we make it happen, we label these things as innovative. They become remarkable somehow. They become the exception in the curriculum. They, uh, they are often voluntary. Often students can take a whole program without having these experiences. And we tend to also place them in separate spaces on campus. Isn't that interesting? And I, I just have to dilute this a little bit. Um, I think there, are, there is a collusion here. Because actually, if you have, if you have demands and, and you don't really want to change what you're doing, you can make a little space and say, yeah, here are these guys who are working on that. So by absorbing those demands, you could say that an innovation space is protecting the normal disciplinary organization for having to deal with these demands. Um, we have an innovation office at our, at our university, just so that no one else has to innovate anything. You know? <laughs> we, we used to have a, an equality, okay, I won't go into that. Uh, I can also say, and now I'm, I'm, uh, I have to confess as, as an innovator myself in education, 
we sometimes collude with this image because we want to be seen as special and novel and uh, value-adding and uh, everything so that we get those resources and we can create these wonderful spaces. It's fun to feel like special. It's fun to be the good exception. Um, so sometimes we don't protest this narrative. So how new is it? If I go back and look at what has been discussed in educational conferences for decades, these things are not new. Digitalization is new, but apart from that, all these modes of more authentic education, more creative, more attuned to the motivation of students, to the needs of society, those narratives are not new. Uh, I wrote a paper where I trace it as far back as 1920. So, um, we, we can say it's perceived novelty. <laughs> we think it's new because it's different from the disciplinary organization that we were brought up in. So we think of it as new. But I can tell you, the general public, they are totally shocked to hear that this is not the normal mode of engineer, or engineering education. What do you mean? Don't you do that? Isn't that 80% of what the students do? Mm, maybe later, we say. <laughs> Yeah, so I think it's really wonderful to actually uh, celebrate a full professorship in this context. Because that shows that it is not just exceptional, it is not just um, peripheral, it is becoming more mainstream and the more disciples you can have and the more you mainstream this and make it uh, reach more uh, educational programs, more students. It can become more normal, because it should be. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. <laughs>